we've been doing this for three weeks. <laughs> and the best part about it is it's also a homecoming for me. I can't think of a better group of people to be with when I say this for the first time in public. I am deeply honored to be representing the English learner community. Students, parents, guardians, teachers, advocates, all of you. I am deeply honored. I will admit that this transition to this new job and this new city in DC has been quite an adjustment for me. <laughs> Take the commute alone. This morning I wake up, I'm at home, so I poured a cup of coffee, I walked out into the, the deck, and I saw the little squirrels playing around, I'm surrounded by trees, a couple cardinals were eating from our bird feeder. I think one of them even looked at me and kind of winked. Like, <laughs> I remember you, welcome back. Got in the car and started driving down the, the tree-lined streets. Stopped at Bojangles, had yeah. some chicken and biscuits. <laughs> the lady behind the counter was like, thank you, sweetie. And I was like, sweetie, yeah. I am kind of a sweet guy, thank you. <laughs> it just felt so happy. Of course, I see all these friendly faces compared to DC. <laughs> so my family, they haven't joined me yet. The girls are finishing school. Um, so I'm living in a, in a basement right now. There's no windows. I wake up in the morning and it's pitch black, like Silence of the Lambs. I wake up, my daughter gave me her little teddy bear just so that I can have a piece of home with me. So I literally clutch the teddy bear and look for the switch and switch it on and finally you know, I can see. Pour my cup of coffee, but I gotta drink it fast because I'm not allowed to take food or drinks on the metro. And I get into the metro and everyone's either glued to their smartphones or they're all angry because they're reading the paper and it's all politics and stuff. No one acknowledges me. And I just sit there looking around, waiting to see if someone would look my way so I could get some eye contact and ask them how they're doing. I think it's gotten to a point that people recognize me and they're like, there's that creepy guy that tries to make eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sit on the other side of the train. And I get to my stop and kind of, it's crazy. I mean, you just get out and you're kind of bumping into each other there and you go up the escalator and I figured out the rules. So if you stay on the right side, you can cruise on up. If you're on the left side, you got it's kind of like Survivor. You got to kind of claw your way to the top because those are the people that are in a hurry. So I always get on the right side and kind of like all the way to the right because people kind of nudge you if they're in a hurry. I get to the top and there's a street performer that's there every day. God bless her. And she sings the most depressing song I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> it's like, my boyfriend left me and he's got no soul. Icebergs are melting in the North Pole. And it's like awful. And I give her a few bucks, you know, because I feel bad. And I, I realized the other day I'm paying her to bum me out in the morning. But that, that's her okay. And then, you know, crosswalks, they should put the like, crosswalk signs with like little quotation marks on, on the side because it's like survivor there also. Cars are dashing by and you got to kind of dodge your way to the building. So needless to say, I am so happy to be home and to be with all of you. It's, it's, it's the best feeling in the world. That being said, when I do go up the escalator and I pass the street performer, her name, her stage name is Sunshine, by the way, which I find kind of funny. <laughs> and I pass her, the first thing I see is the Washington Monument. <clears throat> and then as I turn towards the education building and start walking, I see the Capitol in the background. That's where it hits me, and it doesn't get old. I'm reminded of the privilege and responsibility that I have been given, and I'm humbled every time. And that's when I tell myself, I'm giving it my all today, and I'm gonna be a voice for my kids, a strong voice for my kids. The other cool thing is, the building is across the street from the Museum of uh, Air and Space, the Air and Space Museum. So every morning, I'm reminded of the contribution English learners have given us. I'm reminded of Jose Arenales. I met Jose here my first year working for the Migrant Education Program. I invited him over to speak to our kids. Jose, his family moved down from Michoacan, Maine. They lived in California, and he worked the fields with his parents, picking crops. He didn't learn English till he was 12 years old, but he excelled in math, and science, and in 2009, he was the mission specialist for NASA on the space shuttle Discovery. He was the first person to ever use the Spanish language out in space. <laughs> I 
So I, I think it's kind of funny. We tell our kids, aim for the, for the stars, right? And this guy literally went to the stars. He overcame everything. Poor, migratory farm worker, English learner. And, and, and again, literally reached the stars. We can help our students dream just as big. Not, not just dream, but achieve those dreams. Mr. Hernandez and I share a similar story. Now, I'm not as smart, <laughs> and I'm afraid of heights, but we have a journey that's been, that's, that kind of aligns. Uh, my father was a, a political prisoner in Cuba, and he begged his pregnant wife to leave Cuba so their soon to, born, soon to be born son would have freedoms and opportunities. And she did. She started working in a factory. She was a seamstress making children's clothes. And soon after I was born, uh, I, I always joke that I was made in Cuba, <laughs> and I was born here. And I, you know, Jose was out in the fields and I was in a factory and I would pick up the scraps for my mom so she could use the scraps to, to, to make, make clothes. And eventually I started kindergarten. I didn't know a word of English. And poor Mrs. Larkin, they didn't have ESL symposium in the 70s. They didn't have all this research and all these, all these resources. She had to figure it out. And I was the only Latino kid in her class, a little freckle-faced Cuban kid. But you know what? The first words I learned from her were, I love you, hmm. and you can do it. She made me feel secure and confident and treasured. And I learned English. I don't know how she did it. It was a miracle. And I'm not, I still you know, struggle with English, but she did it. And when I finished kindergarten, my dad finally joined us, and he needed a job, and he needed to learn English. So his little freckle face, soon to be first grader, started teaching his dad English. Now, I, I told him, Papi, you can do it. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm Latino, we're kind of macho sometimes, so I didn't say I love you, but I said, and I like you a lot. <laughs> And that's when I fell in love with education, and I became a teacher. Uh, got my degree in elementary and ESOL uh, education. My first class was in this area in Miami we called Little Managua, because it was an area where there was a big Nicaraguan community. They all left the Contra Wars of the 80s and, and established themselves there. So there I was with my degree and over 30 English learners, and I had to figure it out. I used a lot of Mrs. Larkin's I tried my best to make them feel confident and loved. And they worked their tails off for me, and, and, and I'll never forget. I'll never forget. Then, as my friends told me, I joined the dark side and became an administrator. But I'll get into that. I'll get into that. <laughs> <laughs> so, listen, what, the reason why I'm telling you this is that those experiences and the people that I've encountered along the way have shaped my passion that I bring to Washington. I mean, I, I can't tell you, you probably can't tell, but I'm so enthusiastic and energetic about the, the work that we're going to be able to do together. I don't need to tell you how much is riding on our shared efforts, though. There's 5 million English learners in our country. That's almost 10% of our student population. When I sit in our senior staff meetings with the secretary, there's about 20 of us in the room. And I always remind them, hey, there's, I represent 10% of the kids in our schools. If we think about our group here, our group of 20, that would mean that there would be two of us that had to do all the duties that you all are doing and all the same work that learn English at the same time. English learners, oh, you know, and also I wanted to mention, I, I just pulled it up yesterday, I think we're in North Carolina, we're at close to, close to 100,000 English learners, somewhere around 97,000 English learners. It's about 6% of the school population here in North Carolina. 6%. We're top 10 in the nation. And you know what? I know. I think you know this part. We're the fastest growing in the nation. English learners represent an incredible asset to our country. And as we know, they also face unique challenges. The other day, something came across my, my desk that kind of deflated me. It ruined my day. They came to me and they told me, hey, Jose, 
2014-2015 numbers show that 65% of our English learners graduate. Mm. But when I did the math, I said that means a million seven hundred and fifty thousand kids didn't. A million seven hundred and fifty thousand English learners did not graduate high school two years ago. That's staggering. It broke my heart. I'm sure there was an astronaut somewhere in that, in that group. That's why this symposium, that's why the work you do is, it, it matters more today than ever before. Supporting English learners is a key part of this administration's vision for education. You know, this is kind of the way, this is government talk here, but, but they see it that their success is vital to the prosperity of our nation. And we, our office, wants to empower all of you with the tools you'll need to help these kids be successful. In the office I now lead, OELA, the Office of English Language Acquisition, our mission is to ensure that English learners attain uh, proficiency in the language and academic success. But at the same time, one of the things that I sat down and told them that we're going to promote and we're going to commit to is preserving their culture and their language preserving their heritage. When my parents come to town and they hang out with my daughters, it's a beautiful moment for me. Because they sit down and they start talking in Spanish about life in Cuba. And my girls talk to them in Spanish about their life here. And they draw their parallels. And my dad talks about baseball. My mom talks about going to Guinces. You know, parties for girls turning 15. So now my girls want to have a Guinness when they turn 15, so I got to start saving this. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's beautiful. And when I see that, it's just so touching for me. And I'm like, we can't, we can't take this away from our kids, from our immigrants when they come here. Just because we're, they're learning English, I mean, they need to learn English, but goodness gracious, well, they, they also need to know about their country. They need to know about their heritage. And they need to keep speaking their, their, their native language. We also promote opportunities for biliteracy and multiliteracy for all kids. All kids. It's such an important tool and such an important gift to give someone. Um, when I worked here, my dear friend and colleague, she was our administrative assistant for migrant ed, Paula, introduced me to her son, Joel. Joel attends Selma Elementary School. Are there any Yellow Jackets in here today? Any Selma Elementary teachers? No? Selma Elementary. Out in Selma, North Carolina, Johnston County. Born and raised Johnston County kid, Joel. Speaks Spanish way better than I do. And I was made in Cuba. <laughs> the kid blows me away. It's poetic when he's, when, he's, when he's speaking in Spanish. It's a beautiful thing to see. He could be talking about anything, and to me, it's, it sounds like poetry. He could be talking about picking his nose, and I'm like, that's beautiful, man. Your Spanish is awesome. What an amazing thing to do. So the first thing I did when I sat in the office was like, we, 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 we got to push this. We promote all, we, um, we also, um, we promote a bunch of other things. So you can talk to me, I'll be, I'll be hanging out. We can talk about all the good things we're doing. Spend too much time addressing that. But how, if you're wondering, how do we do this? And this I do have to read. I've only been here three, three weeks. So we promote national leadership by informing policy decisions. We administer discretionary grants uh, to prepare professionals for teaching and supporting English learners. We're in the middle of a big professional learning uh, grant application process right now. Mm -hmm. We invest in research and evaluation studies that have practical applications for preparing English learners to meet college and career learning standards. And we disseminate information about educational research practices and policies for English learners. A couple of other things that I added to this was one of, one of the big things is Elevate English learners in our national conversation. I mean, that's a big deal for me. I keep telling my staff, I, I'm not going to be here very long. You know, this is, this is a limited term that I'm going to be in. If there's one thing I want to make sure to do is that everyone knows about English learners. As a matter of fact, I was invited to the Vice President's uh, uh, Cinco de Mayo celebration. So I showed up. I was at the White House. It was great. I mean, there was drinks, 
lots of hors d'oeuvres, there was a mariachi band, and then a lot of people. And I was like, I'm going to talk to the vice president about the New York Slurs. So I had, I, I don't know, I don't know if it was the two Dos Equis that I drank. <laughs> but I was feeling like the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> and I went up to the vice president. Some people told me I cornered the vice president. <laughs> and I started talking about the English Slurs. And he tried to connect with me. He told me that he was named after his grandfather, who was an Irish immigrant, and became a bus driver. And I said, you know what, Mr. President? You, that's half of the story of our kids. Now think about if your grandfather and his kids couldn't speak the language. That's an extra challenge, huh? An extra obstacle. We just talked for a while. He, uh, you know, there's something about him. And he, he, he looked at me and he's like, Jose, we'll, we'll continue this conversation. Now, I, don't, I didn't have it. I still don't have business cards. I've only been here for three weeks. So I wrote my name and phone number on a Dos Equis bottle. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been cool, though, right? Here you go, Mr. Vice President. He's like walking around with the Dos Equis bottle. But um, that's, that's one thing I want to achieve, is for people to be talking about our kids. I, the first thing I did when I, when I joined the department was run to the Office of Migrant Education to, to hang out with my old boss, Lisa Ramirez. I'm like, Lisa, she's like, what's name? We're like hugging and crying and laughing and we were just so emotional. And I was like, I'm so happy to be here. I can't wait to see all the work we've been doing together, that our offices have been doing together. She's like, Jose, we don't, we don't work together. We don't do anything together. I was like, well, well, you're the Office of Migrant Education more than half of your kids are English learners. Mm -hmm. And your office does not collaborate with my office? I, could, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. The other day, they had a big STEM meeting. And I showed up, I went to the STEM meeting, they're like, hey, Jose, what are you doing here? This is a STEM meeting. I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, yeah, no, it's not English learners. This is, this is for STEM. Oh. <laughs> I don't know, but I gave them the Jose Hernandez speech, and English murder, and astronaut, and I was so angry that they were like, okay, okay, sit at the head of the table, You're, it's okay, we're sorry. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't mean to insult you. But that's, that's kind of the way it's been. And we need to be the voices of our kids, of our English learners. Who else can do it? Now, that being said, I can't do it alone. And experience has taught me that those closest to the problem are the ones that are best suited to solve them. That's you guys. You know, the secretary and I, we don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. But that's one thing where we do connect. You guys are the most important piece of this puzzle. One of the important roles of LF can play is to highlight your most effective practices and share that with the nation. And there's some excellent stuff being done in this country and in this state. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so happy that this is my first appearance with North Carolina, a state that's doing some amazing things. The ESL team is, is already planning some visits for me and the secretary here in North Carolina, so I might be seeing you again. I want to thank you for your courage and your commitment. And here's my charge for this symposium. As you attend the sessions, I urge you to engage and learn about current topics in ESL. I need you to network with each other and learn each other's best practices so you can, you can fine tune your craft. Because we need you to teach, serve, and support our English learners. I know the work you do has a profound impact on our kids. And I know our kids have a profound impact on you. Because that's true for me. Working here with the Migrant Education Program changed my life forever. When I go to a supermarket and I'm holding a peach in my hand or, or I'm cutting into a tomato, I can't help but think of the families that sacrifice to get the food on my table. And at the same time, they're planting seeds of hope for their kids. What they do for us, it's just staggering. I can tell you stories that will break your heart. Hundreds of stories. As a matter of fact, there was getting to a point in, in my work here, I was here for eight years where I was like, gosh, I'm never going to fix this. But every now and then, you know, there was a story that would stand out, kind of a highlight, a flash of light. I think of um, Alejandro Navaret, Randolph County, Alex, one of the first kids I ever recruited into the migrant ed program. He was a high school kid. 
brilliant, top of his class. Learned English in no time. He told me, Maestro, I have to drop out. And I was like, yeah, right. Yeah, you're one of the smartest kids in your school. I, I, I can't stay. My parents need me to work. And we have no transportation. The only transportation we have is when the crew leader comes and picks my parents up and takes them to the fields. And I gotta join them. We need money. So this can't, this, this can't be. I was bummed out, I got in the car, started heading out, not even half a mile away, I passed by this huge used car lot, and I pulled over, walked in, this good old boy, big southern guy walks up to me, Sam, you know, gave me the pitch, like, wanna buy a car, you know? I was like, actually what I need is a job for a kid, a brilliant kid that's gonna drop out, is there anything you can offer this kid? And he did. He brought him in, and he did kind of like detailing and washing cars and getting them for, ready for sale. The owner couldn't believe the kid's worth at the work ethic. He loved Alex. He started teaching him how to work on cars and fix the engines and get the engines ready. I got a call from Alex not so long ago, one of the few students I gave my personal number to. He's one semester away from getting his master's mm. in automotive engineering. Full ride. And the work he did at the, at, at the um, car lab gave his family enough money to make it through the tough times. His parents are proud of him, I'm proud of him, but you know who's the proudest of all? Is this good old boy, big southern guy, Sam. Probably the most, probably the most important teacher in his life. Mm -hmm. Who knew, right? I had to think outside the box on that one, and I'm not very bright, but we made it work. I know you guys have stories like that also, and I need to hear them. Oella needs to hear them, because that's how we can figure out how to solve this problem how to graduate more kids. So you stop me, I'm gonna be hanging out all day. You corner me like I did with the vice, with the vice president. I don't, do we have those, I didn't see the problem. <laughs> and, and, and talk to me, talk to me. When you talk to me, you're talking to the secretary because there's no one between me and her, okay? So, tell us what you're doing, tell us how we can help our kids, and they're counting on us to help them. When we do what we do for our kids, they will set their sights on the stars and soar. And this is what I tell the secretary, they'll take our country with them. So I hope at the end of my term, whatever you call it, last time I go up the escalators, I'm gonna walk up to Sunshine. I'm gonna say, Sunshine, we're gonna write a new song. I'm gonna be, we're gonna do a duet. I'm from North Carolina, so I'll be Moonshine. <laughs> Work with me. And we're going to write a new song about how awesome our kids are and how successful our English learners are. Thanks again, Toby, Kathy. Thank you, thank you for having me. This is really special for me to be here with all of you, with my family from North Carolina. Keep doing what you're doing. We're here. We've got your back. And, uh, see you around. Thank you.